A little boy in school was drawing a picture. The teacher came over and looked at his work and couldn't quite tell what it was he was doing. And uh, so she said to him, uh, what are you drawing? And without a moment's hesitation, the little boy replied, I'm drawing a picture of God. The teacher said, you can't draw a picture of God. No one knows what God looks like. To which the boy replied, well, they will when I'm done. <laughs> Seriously, how do we know what God is like? Philip, who was a disciple of Jesus, said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. That's in John 14, 8, which Carlin read for us earlier. And Jesus replied, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. You know, we've all heard the, the saying, like Father, like Son. Well, in the case of Jesus and the Heavenly Father, you have a perfect picture of what God is like. Because Jesus shows us exactly, perfectly, the character of God. The Bible puts it this way. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. That's Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus asked Philip, how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? And then he went on to explain that the words he spoke were his Father's words. And the works he performed were his Father's works. And then Jesus made the most outrageous statement, I think, that I have ever heard. In John 14, verses 12 to 14, Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now you've got it here. That is about the most amazing statement. I confess that I don't fully understand all that Jesus meant when he said this. But I do fully believe it. And one thing I know for sure, this promise of Jesus is worth more than a million dollars at the bank. Listen again to the words of Jesus. I will do whatever you ask in my name. Ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Limitless possibilities are open to the believer who earnestly seeks God in prayer. Jesus has basically signed his name on the bottom of the check and invited us to fill in the amount above his signature. Could there be a more powerful incentive for us to correct? My purpose in standing before you today is to call you to prayer. Perhaps some of you are thinking, well, I suppose a little prayer can't do any harm. If that's what you're thinking, then please consider this comment by Henry Nell. If we think that a little prayer can't do any harm, we will soon find that it can't do much good either. Prayer has meaning only if it is necessary and indispensable. Years ago, I had the opportunity to visit Mother Teresa's home for the destitute and dying in Calcutta, India. Mother Teresa became famous for her work with dying people, lepers, unwanted children. And this is what she had to say about prayer. She said, love to pray. Feel often during the day the need for prayer and take trouble to pray. Prayer enlarges the heart until it is capable of containing God's gift of himself. <coughs> Ask and seek and your heart will grow big enough to receive him and keep him as your own. Today I am calling our church family to prayer. Or three things. Three things which God has laid on my heart. First of all, I'm asking you to pray.
pray for our town of Delisle and the area around it. Pray for our town. Perhaps you feel that Delisle is insignificant because it's a small town. That the real action is in bigger cities like Saskatoon or Regina or Edmonton. But I want to tell you today with absolute assurance that small towns are not insignificant to God. Millions of our fellow Canadians live in small towns or rural areas. And in fact, around the world, literally billions of people live in small towns. Jesus was born in a small town. Bethlehem, at the time of Jesus, had somewhere between 300 and 1,000 permanent residents, smaller than the town of Goliath. And Jesus was raised in Nazareth and spent most of his life there. And Nazareth, at the time of Jesus, had about 500 people living in it. And Nazareth didn't have much of a reputation either. When Philip told his friend Nathaniel, we have found him of whom Moses in the Torah and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, Come and see. Come and see. I love that phrase. Come and see. Jesus was from a small town. So, for his followers, not to love small towns is, to say the least, concerning. And Jesus wasn't just from a small town. He spent most of his ministry time in small towns. He continued to go to small towns even when his fame began to spread everywhere. Jesus said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I have come. That's Luke 4, 43. Some of you are uh, old enough to remember the television show, The Beverly Hillbillies, right? And uh, The Beverly Hillbillies, the premise was that this uh, hillbilly family uh, struck oil on their land and became uh, suddenly very rich and famous. And, and of course, what happened? The kin folks said, you get away from there. California is the place you ought to be. So they packed up their truck and they moved to Beverly Hills, that is. <laughs> Swimming pools, movie stars. You know, it's interesting to me that Jesus didn't pack up and move to the big city when he became famous. He continued to work in the small towns and out-of-the-way places. You know, the biggest towns in Galilee, the province where Jesus grew up, at the time of Christ, were Sephoris and Tiberias. But as far as we know, Jesus never even visited those. At least there's no mention of it in the Bible. He may have gone there, but we don't know. Jesus attended the Jewish religious festivals in Jerusalem, which was the capital city. But you know, the scripture never records that he even spent one night in Jerusalem until he was taken there for his trial at the end of his life. Not only did Jesus minister in small towns, he sent his disciples to do the same thing. He gave directions. Matthew chapter 10, verse 11. Whatever town or village you enter. And then he gave specific directions for how they should conduct themselves there. Jesus was and still is concerned about the people in small towns. Now my point is not that we should avoid ministry in the city. My point is that God doesn't need a great big city in order to accomplish great things. God doesn't need a head start. Jesus loves the liar. And so do I, frankly. He has given me a real love for the people of Delisle and area. I love Delisle, and I hope you do too. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that God needs a big place to work with if he's going to do something really significant. Our God is not limited. He is the God of the impossible. Our faith rests in his bigness, not our own. I love how William Carey puts it. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. 
The plain truth is that people in the Lyle need Jesus. Hell is a terrible place, and eternity is a long time. And that is why I am calling on our church family to pray for Delilah and the people who live here. <coughs> Secondly, I'm calling you this morning to prayer for our church, Delilah Community Chapel. I am so excited that Jesus is changing lives here. Next Sunday, we're going to have some more baptisms. And that is a, the best evidence that I know of what God is doing inside of people. We can't see the hearts, only God can. But it is an outward sign of an inward change that we are marking when baptisms happen. In the month of July, we average eight people in worship here, which is a new high. <laughs> Obviously, people didn't get the word that we were supposed to be having a summer slump. <laughs> And I thank God for that. He deserves all the credit and all the glory for the good things that are happening. I believe that God has placed DCC in Delisle in order to win this town for Jesus Christ. But I want to say to you today, there is so much work left to do. During the summer months, we're the only church in Delisle that's meeting on a regular basis. We thank God for others who share the good news. Uh, there are people who attend other churches uh, here in Delisle or in Asquith or Van Scor, or a few people that go to the city for church. I do believe, however, that at the outside on any given Sunday, there would be less than 150 people from Delisle in church anywhere. And if you think that the population is 1,500 people, that means that maybe 10% are in church on any given Sunday. And even if there are those who are away or traveling, like it's happening here this week, and you add up all the people who ever go to church on a semi-regular basis, it would not be more than 20% of the population of our town. We have a big job to do. Loving God, loving people, making disciples. You know, in John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says, in this world, we are like him, like Jesus. In this world, now, we are like him. Pray that we will be so much like Jesus that we will be able to say, as Philip said to Nathaniel, come and see. You want to see what God is like? You want to see what God is doing? Come to DCC and see. Psalm 55, verse 17 says, Evening, morning, and noon. I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. The, the phrase, I cry out, would signify intense prayer. It's interesting that it says uh, evening, morning, and noon, instead of morning, noon, and evening, like we would probably say. The reason for that is that the Jewish people consider the day to start at sundown rather than at dawn. That is actually more biblical. If you read the creation story, in the first chapter of Genesis, for example, it says there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and there was morning the second day, and so forth, <coughs> third, fourth, fifth, sixth, right? But the fact is, most Christians, if they pray at all, pray at mealtimes. And usually we eat three meals a day. So if we would even remember <coughs> to pray morning, noon, and evening, for our church. What difference could that make? As you pray for your meal today, perhaps you would consider adding the phrase, God bless and use the live community chapel. God bless DCC. First, pray for our town. Secondly, pray for our church. And before I tell you the third thing that I'm calling you to pray for, I want to tell you a little story. For her birthday, my wife Ruth received a card from her sister Laura. And on the front of that card it said, I couldn't have had a better sister. Inside it said, I know I couldn't because I asked mom and dad if I could and they said no. <laughs> so, starting 
today, I want you to ask your Heavenly Father for a better pastor. <laughs> Not a different pastor, just a better one. <laughs> Pray that I will be a better pastor. You know, it has been said that to some extent every group of people deserves the leader it has because every group, directly or indirectly, influences who its leaders are and what they're like. And this is especially true in the spiritual realm. The church body has a tremendous influence in determining what type of leadership it has, and the chief way that you do this is through prayer. Now, I know that many of you do pray for me, and I am grateful for it. I also know that it is my responsibility to solicit your prayers on my behalf. The Apostle Paul did it on a regular basis. In almost every one of his letters to the churches, Paul requested prayer for himself and his ministry. To the Romans, he said, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. To the Ephesians, he wrote, Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearless, fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. To the Philippians, he wrote, I, knew, I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. And to the Colossians, he wrote, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. So I'm going to ask you today to pray for me. Pray that I would be a spiritual leader, with unshakable confidence in God and in His Word. You know, there's great concern in our day for political correctness. I am much more concerned about spiritual correctness. Pray that I would be a man of vision, because the Bible says that without vision the people perish. I want to see what God sees, and I want to see it the way He sees it. And that includes circumstances and people. And I pray that you would have, I ask that you would pray that I would have a burden for both kinds of people. And by both kinds of people, I mean the unsaved who need God's salvation and those who already know Him, that Christ would be fully formed in their lives. Pray that I will have knowledge, a deep personal knowledge of Jesus our Messiah. In His life, His death, His resurrection, His exaltation, and His imminent return. Pray that I would have a knowledge of God's Word and know how to communicate it and how to apply it. And then pray that I would have a knowledge of myself. John Maxwell says, you need to know yourself to grow yourself. <coughs> and pray that I would have humility. Jesus, our Lord, was humble. He said, I am gentle and humble in heart. The Bible says that God teaches the humble His ways. It's only the humble to whom God shows His way. Pray that I would have wisdom and discernment. Pray that I would have courage and be able to speak with authority when I speak God's Word. Pray that I would have patience. St. Vincent de Paul said, He who is in a hurry delays the things of God. And then I would ask that you would pray for my marriage. Pray for my wife. There are uh, stresses and pressures that uh, come to her because of her role as the wife of your pastor. And she needs your prayers too. Pray for my family. kids, grandkids, that we would all together be able to know and represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for my co-workers. 
And when I say co-workers, I include the people on our leadership team, but I also include every member of the DCC church family. Because we are all called to be workers together with God. Finally, I would ask that you would pray for me that I would be filled with the love of God which comes from Jesus Christ by His Spirit. I love you guys. And I want to love you more. I want to love the people around us in this town and area so much that they'll be drawn to the Jesus that we know and love. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the, the amazing promise that, that Jesus made about prayer. Jesus, I thank you that you said that we could ask you for anything in your name and you would do it. So, by your Spirit, help us to know what it is that we should ask for. And today, God, I've asked this church family for prayer, that they would really take a, a serious look and, and commitment to praying for our town, praying for our church, and praying for their pastor. God, I, I feel the need for their prayers. And I thank you for them. Now, God, I ask that you would really uh, pound into our hearts any, any commitments that are being made. If, if people are saying silently where they are that they, that they intend to pray more, don't let that be something that's forgotten when we leave church this morning. May it actually change the way we conduct ourselves this afternoon and evening and through the days of this week. All these things, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor, before you go any further, and I don't want you to answer this question, but it's something else to add to your message, is when you talk about the percentage of people in our community that go to church, I wonder what the percentage of people are that are lonely and hurting in our community. And I, I think you'd be taken aback, all of us, as to how, what that number would be. But just think about that as you interact with people in our town. There are people who are hurting and are very lonely. Absolutely. And sometimes to, to acknowledge them and to stop and encourage them, and all of those things, that's where we start. Yeah. As we interact with people, as we share life with them, as we love them in whatever way we can, that is what draws them to the Jesus that we know, right? We're in this thing together. Love your neighbor. Every one of us is called to be a missionary. Think of it that way. We're all on a mission. A mission for God. We should make a difference in the lives of the people around us. I'm curious. How many of you this morning have, have decided where you are that you're going to do more praying this week for your town, your church, and your pastor? Put up your hand. Do you believe that the law is going to be different this week than it was last week? I do. I believe that the law is going to be a better place this week because of your prayers and because of the God we have who answers.